it's Judy Love Bowman, a.k.a. Dr. Judy Online. Welcome back as we continue to read from Peaches, Womanist Thoughts on Finding Peace, Overcoming Peril, and Tapping Power. And if you're new to this channel, welcome. Please subscribe so you can be made aware every time we have new uploads. And if you're just joining us, we're on Chapter 3. That's page 105, Black Economic Power. And on chapter three, you will find these words. I saw a viral video, Black Wallets Matter. The truth is, black wallets do matter. Black people have the spending power of an entire country, our foundation. During the post-World War II era, it was considered inappropriate to flaunt wealth and show off in America. During the Reagan era ethos, the number of millionaires tripled, and it was great to appear rich and show off wealth. These contexts apply to white Americans. Most upwardly mobile black people in America were trying to purchase their first home while others lived in government housing during this time. Although I attended primary and secondary school for 12 years and college for 11, I cannot remember either a course or a lecture in economics other than home economics with Ms. Brooks at C. Vernon Spratley Junior High School. I began to learn more about economics from our son, Legend. While discussing this chapter with him, he explained the difference between the way returns on capital are far more profitable than earning wages. Some might ask why I go to college to earn a, rate, a wage if I can make more money investing. Personally, I think college should be a natural progression from high school to all who are able. Investing is definitely the right way to go. Legend also explained to me the way people with higher wages tend to cluster. Hypothetically, for example, if the median income in Mississippi is $30,000 and the median income in Connecticut is $70,000, people in the South may have harsher economic challenges. There's a school of thought that believes in what we live in. There's a school of thought that believes that we live in eco chambers. Studies have shown that most people get job referrals from people they know. Therefore, if everyone around you is a software engineer, you are closer to that idea network. Similarly, if everyone around you is an exotic dancer, you are closer to that idea network. This is one reason Oprah Winfrey is so celebrated in my estimation. She is beautiful, black, she is a beautiful black female from Mississippi where most of the people who look like her in her idea network were maids. She broke through the glass ceiling. Bravo, Oprah. Oprah is another legendary peach. She is not only a history maker, she's also an independently wealthy, financially savvy, mobile peach. <laughs> First published in French in 2013, in English in 2014 and shared with me by my son in 2016, Capital in the 21st Century is groundbreaking with regard to an outlook on global inequity. In the interest of time, I present, I present a few important points from The Economist, whose editor summarized Thomas Piketty's 10 years of research presented in Capital in four paragraphs. Referred to by some as the modern-day Marx, Piketty derives a grand theory of capital and inequity. Quote, as a general rule, wealth grows faster than economic output. Other things being equal, which is a long stretch for blacks and women, faster economic growth will diminish the importance of wealth in a society, whereas slower growth will increase it. And demographic change that slows global growth will make capital more dominant. Although Piketty's book attracted a great deal of criticism, it was on our son's reading list in school and my first lengthy study of economics. Perhaps the main criticism of Piketty's theories and policy recommendations are that, are that rather than emphasizing economics, they emphasize ideology. As a social scientist, I understand that in real life, the two are enmeshed. Economics are related to ideology simply because of the context. Within the black community, economics has different representations or manifestations because of context as well. 
For example, the black minister and his or her spouse may have a big car and matching outfits each day during a 10-day conference, but may have neither investments, savings, nor property ownership unless they have an independent business. Black buying power has a huge impact on the North American and international markets. In his movie, The Nutty Professor, Eddie Murphy featured comedian Dave Chappelle, who magnified black female buying habits with his now famous lines, women be shopping, women be shopping, women be shopping. <laughs> yes, we have to gather and have inventory for our homes, families, and businesses. However, we're doing a lot more than that. According to a 2011 study, African Americans' buying power is expected to reach $1.1 trillion by 2015. This same report from Nielsen and the National Newspaper Publishers Association presented the following conclusions. One, with a buying power of nearly $1 trillion annually, if African Americans were a country, they'd be the 16th largest country in the world. Two, the number of African American households earning $75,000 or, high, or higher grew by almost 64% at a rate close to 12% greater than the change in the overall population's earning between 2000 and 2009. This continued growth in affluence, social influence, and household income will continue to impact the community's economic power. Three, African Americans make more shopping trips than all other groups, but spend less money per trip. African Americans in higher income brackets also spend 300% more in higher end retail grocers more than any other high income household. Four, there were 23.9 million active African American internet users in July 2011 76% of whom visited a social networking or blog site. Five, 33% of all African Americans own a smartphone. Today, with unlimited plans and free government phones, the number has increased. Six, African Americans use more than double the amount of mobile phone voice minutes compared to whites. 1,298 minutes a month versus 606. Seven, the percentage of African Americans attending college or earning a degree has increased to 44% for men and 53% for women. We will each have more money to save and invest if we follow any and all of the financial tips in the following section. Money saving tips for peaches on the overground. Number one, skip eating slash ordering out and save up to 200 dollars or more each week. Number two, negotiate and reset phone, satellite, and cable contracts. Number three, transfer all credit cards to zero interest cards, then eliminate or limit using them. Four, buy pre-owned cars, clothing, and household items. Dr. Thinkenshine teaches that the proper relationship to material things is stewardship, not consumption. Five, Increase the deductible on homeowners or renters' contents insurance policy, which will lower the premium. Also, compare companies and rates. Six, compare fees and minimum deposit requirements between banks and credit unions, as well as different types of accounts. For example, some accounts charge no fees if you maintain a minimum balance. Seven, although some discriminate based on zip codes, secure web based estimates with reviews on home repairs, automobile sales, and mortgage rates. Eight, if you purchase property at an auction with pre-approved financing, be sure to bid only on property that has a clear title. Nine, avoid payday loans, title loans, and other predatory, predatory lenders. 10, invest in stocks. I find it best to engage money managers who usually get fired if they do not perform well and earn incent incentive bonuses if they do. Please also consider Roth, IRAs, and mutual funds. 11. Buy gold. 12. Limit impulsive purchases and shopping sprees. Try to use lists and coupons. 13. 
Keep small denomination bills, 1.1s, 5s, and 10s, along with quarters in a locked box at your residence. If there is ever a power outage and the ATMs are inaccessible, you can pay more for necessities. For example, you may pay $20 for a bag of ice for someone to run an errand or for someone to run an errand if you have no change. No matter what we earn, save, spend, and invest, to some, most black women are considered to be welfare queens who live off the fat of the land. Welfare queens. Many of us are degraded for being considered welfare queens, yet in many subcultures, black women often feel as if they have no choice. In 1976, Ronald Reagan told the story of Linda Taylor, a scam artist, who allegedly made over $150,000 per year on government assistance in an effort to make a statement about the deserving and undeserving poor. Rather than focusing on historical, psychosocial, and economic factors which led to poverty, which lead to poverty, many choose to evaluate poor people and consider their station to be some type of personal failure or group pathology. As a young activist unaware of certain policy decisions, I went to Washington, D.C. with the Republican Women of Virginia and volunteered for Republican candidates Herb Bateman and Paul Tribble. Although I was too young to vote, I was Team Reagan and even led the Pledge of Allegiance at the 1980 Virginia State Convention. I am also certain that one of Reagan's slogans was, let's make America great again. I must say that the Republican women of Virginia were very kind to me and were the first to take me to the White House and the Virginia governor's mansion. Unbeknownst to me, Reaganomics made efforts to reverse certain social programs and those who felt it the most were the poorest, the blackest, and females, and genderqueer. Contrary to certain profiles, everyone on public assistance is not a con artist. Yes, sometimes they teach the next generation how to work the system in order to get more, acquire more, have more, 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 more. In other cases, government assistance is very necessary. House Speaker Paul Ryan was allegedly reared on Social Security due to the death of his father. I extend my condolences to him for his loss. Reportedly, his benefits extended throughout his college years. Our son was reared on Social Security due to some challenges his father experiences. However, his benefits were terminated when he turned 18. Are there moral judgments which place blame and choose to distinguish between the dependence of the deceased, the dependence of the differently abled or physically challenged, and the dependence of those who are incarcerated? Is there a moral judgment that says a young single mother of four who receives government assistance is any less worthy or less respectable than a widowed mother of four or a legally blind person? No one would call a bereaved widow a welfare queen. No one would call a white blue-eyed mother who is addicted to pain medication and has not held a job in 20 years a welfare queen. The profiling needs to end today. Snatching and grabbing. One social scientist told me that we snatch and grab because we do not know how long we're going to live, so we live it up while we're able. Some like WWE, the Wicked Witch of the East, see portrait section of the text, and WWW, Wicked Witch of the West, see portrait section. Snatch and grab so they can appear to have more or do better than other black sisters relatives, co-workers, associates, church members, social media peers, etc. One peach does not have to do better than the next. We can all do better. Most others do not care and our beloved black brothers may not even notice. One mother even wrote in her will, no snatching and grabbing, referring to the material items she left, probably because that is a subculture that has been cultivated and nurtured in some families and social circles. Why would you need to write it unless it was a concern? Since emancipation, some black people try to get all they can as long as they can and so that they can have more than the next black person. How dreadful. 
I, I salute all business owners, investors, hard workers, good stewards, tithers, and other financially conscious black people. With so little time since our removal from slavery and few opportunities available, I would love to hear your story and learn from you. Won't you share your story in the comment sections or you can email me at Dr. Judy online. With the huge contracts associated with professional sports, many black men are drafted or auctioned off and help one or two generations materially. I have been behind the scenes. I assure you that the majority of the managers, attorneys, accountants, realtors, car dealers, jewelers, and promoters are white, Persian, Asian, or something other than black. As history has shown, we have been taught to mistrust one another. That will change starting today. Are you in? Mass incarceration and the slave complex. Mass incarceration and the slave complex, which continues today and was enhanced by the war on drugs and the many drug addicted and mentally challenged black and poor veterans who returned to America, is another reason why economic parity has never come to fruition for black families, which are primarily, 75%, headed by black women, only one generation removed from segregation and a lifetime removed from our culture and our heritage in Africa. Mass incarceration causes many of our black men and poor black women to experience a social death. Because many prisons, juvenile detention centers, and court-mandated mental health sub and slash substance abuse facilities are privately owned, there is, for those who are unethical, an incentive system to incarcerate poor, black and or mentally challenged citizens. Between telecommunications, commissary, probation, parole, drug testing, mental health services, medical services, pharmaceutical services, restaurant services, laundry services, uniforms, camera systems, communication systems, labor and supplies, there is an entire economy involving criminalizing black and poor people. Black and poor people have become commodified for profit. From what I have read over the decades, the criminal justice system has become the largest deliverer of mental health and restaurant services in America. Some immediate things can be done to decrease the number of black boys and girls who are caught in what some call the school to prison pipeline. First, parents, guidance counselors, and social organizations, civil rights groups, religious groups, and black Greeks can work to decrease the number of black and poor children who have low reading levels and are tracked for special education. We need to put PTA, parent-teacher association meetings, parent-teacher conferences, and all important academic appointments, including a warm meal in the morning and stability and reading time in the evenings on our calendars just as faithfully as we do with other things that are important to us. In most jur jurisdictions, prison population predictions are based in part on third and fourth grade reading levels. Second, we can support PACs, political action committees, and politicians who support the decriminalization of marijuana, which would lead to the release of countless black and poor men and women. It would also help people of all ages with health conditions. Aside from dismantling the family, limiting the power of the black male, father, husband figure, being motivated by profit in the private and public prison systems, and being the primary mental health delivery system in America, the prison industrial complex has social expectations for black boys. Sometimes they feel as if they have to live up to the street mentality and have street credibility. Prison takes black men, boys, and women out of our families and out of the workforce. These things have got to change today, one person at a time. War on poverty. The war on poverty is the name that came to be associated with legislation first introduced during President Lyndon B. Johnson's State of the Union Address. In his historic speech, President Johnson urged an all-out war on poverty and unemployment in these United States on Wednesday, January 8th, 1964. President Johnson proposed this legislation in response to a national poverty rate of around 
The war on poverty was considered by many to be the most ambitious domestic policy initiative since the Great Depression. As a result of the study related to the war on poverty, the first step was to pinpoint the problem. The conclusion of the report was presented in the Moynihan Report, quote, at the heart of the deterioration of the fabric of the Negro society is the deterioration of the Negro family. Unless the damage is repaired, all the effort to end discrimination, poverty, and injustice will come to little, end quote. This shifted the focus on the challenges of the black community from external community to internal family. In other words, the problems within the black family became ones which we created, blame the victim, rather than those which were imposed upon us by a country we love, pledge allegiance to, serve, and call home, i.e. slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, sexism, and systemic racism. There are some who argue that, argue that President Johnson's anti-poverty programs have lifted people out of destitution, trapped them in cycles of dependency, or both. According to the calculations of the Census Bureau, the poverty rate has only fallen from 19% in 1964 to 15% in 2012. Poverty among blacks has fallen more sharply than average. According to Pew Research, in 1966, two years after Johnson's speech, four in 10 African Americans were poor. Blacks constituted nearly a third of all poor. By 2012, poverty among African Americans had fallen to 27.2%. Poverty or scarcity of resources has always been a challenge for our race since emancipation. It is considered fashionable or normal in some black subcultures to cry the poor in the mouth. In other subcultures, such as what we call the Negro elite, it is normal to achieve academically, socially, and materially. I asked an older minister what I asked an older minister what poor mouth meant when she used the term almost a decade ago. What do you mean crying poor mouth? Reverend Leakes answered. Oh, he said, I can't, I can't buy a fish sandwich after church because I have to get gas. I only buy cooked food on the third. Okay, I get it. Poverty or scarcity of resources is, a, is natural for a, a group of people who were punished for learning to read, taught to be mistrusted by the masses, taught to mistrust each other, disunity, taught to be envious of other situations, human nature, but instilled in slaves, and taught to hate our color, our hair, our body, odor, etc., which can cause us to be super consumers. I believe poverty was a reality after emancipation for black people, especially black women and children. However, with free community college tuition and free tuition in New York for New York residents, we can look beyond poverty as a lifestyle and a mindset. Today, we can focus on education as a means of liberation. It is true that a degree does not guarantee employment. It is also true that investing is more profitable than earning wages. At the same time, we have to start somewhere. You have to work to earn money to invest. I'm certain you have heard someone say, it's always something. Well, if it ain't one thing, it's another. I think to myself, yes. If it's not one good thing, it's another good thing. Expect good things. We need to create a modern day war on poverty, poverty to help black people, especially black women, since most black children are reared by single mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers. We need to pray for and encourage and motivate one another. Even if we only unify in consciousness, we need to come together to end poverty. President Lyndon Johnson's War on Poverty was designed by the federal government to help black people in America achieve economic parity. It was waged at a time when the percentage of Americans living in poverty had reached an all-time high, and some urban blacks were setting fires to their cities. History repeated itself when poor urban blacks who have historically been marginalized, brutalized, and victimized reacted to police and government misconduct in Ferguson, Missouri, 
following the murder of Michael Brown in 2014, and in Baltimore following the death of Freddie Gray in 2016. Just as is the case today, it became clear in the 1970s that black poverty had to be alleviated if legal rights were to mean anything. Reparations for slavery and Jim Crow is a discussion which resurfaces from time to time. In addition to affirmative action, which is challenged very frequently, reparations Reparations is still an idea which has never come to fruition for several reasons. First, the division of resources, land, influence in all branches of government, intellectual property, i.e. copyrights and trademarks. Most major corporations and producers of U.S. goods were divided, distributed, and, and established before black people could even vote. Theoretically, reparations sound good. I would love to know of a way to make up for the land, laws, free labor, international profiling, educational imbalances, and debasement of black women, men, and children without disturbing the white dominant landowners, families, and businesses. I heard a white male politician say on social media, you got your reparations when you got Obama. If you don't like it, he recommended go back to Africa. That is extreme. God bless him, Jesus. Help him, Lord. All white people do, do not feel that way, and it is not their fault that their ancestors traded in human slaves. That type of trade, when my ancestors were considered to be three-fifths human, was as acceptable today as it is, was ex as acceptable as it is to purchase a tractor or a private jet today. As you know, bus boycotts, lunch counter sit-ins, and other forms of civil and financial protests have helped to fuel the cause of black advancement and upward mobility. At the same time, nothing in the history of America has made us whole for the loss of freedom, life, heritage, image, dignity, and economic parity. According to some undocumented sources, black people spend $1 trillion each year. There's still no equalizer with black and white affluence. Chris Rock, in one of his com comedy, comedy routines, jokingly made light of the fact that he's a star and his next door neighbor is a white dentist. Love, love, love the dentists. But his point is that he is a star while there's a dentist in every city. There's no equalizer. In 2017, someone allegedly sprayed racial slurs on basketball great LeBron James Spence. He's rich, but to some people in, in America, he is still a nigger. To those who vandalize his property, he is just a rich nigger. I believe that shopping, decorating, cooking, dressing, and other forms of outward material expression, which most of us appreciate, was, is our main language of love because of the way we were made to feel on the inside. I think the non-tangible, immeasurable treasure of time is one thing that an unequal playing field as a result of lack of rec reparations has presented to us. I am thankful that I have the health and ability to cook and clean. However, those who have generational wealth can spend that same time reading, relaxing, reflecting, playing, pursuing their dreams, or simply just being. Just being and playing are highly contrived for a peach like me. I have to work at play because all I know is work. Those who are dominant, white, and male with means have more time to do what they want to do, not what they have to do. Like the Honorable Maxine Waters, we need to be involved with reclaiming our time. <laughs> In addition to having the luxury of more time. Those who are dominant do not always have the same need for outward adornment and outward appearances of affluence. For example, I knew of a millionaire who had his shirt sleeve stitched haphazardly. A black colleague asked, what's up with the shirt? He replied, it was my grandfather's shirt. It was perfectly a perfectly good shirt. The sleeves were just too long. If he were a black millionaire, he would not have had on an old shirt that was too big regardless. With 50 million black people in America, we have the wealth of perhaps the 10th richest country in the world. 
Black economic power is critical. And since black women head 75% of black households and household budgets, our economic stewardship is critical in this era of rebuilding and thriving. When I heard Tony Brown speak at Hampton University in 1986, he said money is not black or white. It is green. Spending power is critical. And it is critical that we are faithful stewards over what we have. Scripture teaches that if we're faithful over a few things, God will make us master over many things. Matthew 25, verses 21 and 23. Individually and collectively, we have made wonderful advances within the educational and social sectors. Mary McLeod Bethune wanted to mobilize the potential power of the professional, educational, and social organizations. W.E.B. Du Bois was writing about the economic power of black working people and the importance of newly acquired economic advancement. The potential power of blacks as consumers is powerful. However, since many of our values and internal motives resemble a tissue of emptiness, stricken with low self-worth, feelings of inferiority, shame of our Negroid features, dismay with our round bodies, distrust for and jealousy of each other, and search for the eternal bluest eye, or Pecola's search for unconditional love, the economic power of most blacks has been dealt a disastrous and crushing blow, sometimes at our own hands. We can make a difference if we stay woke and prayerful. Clowns, consumers, or producers, innovators. Because black women head and or have influence in most black households, we can make the shift in the priorities of this generation and the next. Picture this, a beautiful young black mother and her beautiful child dressed in designer clothing, posing in front of a place her mother rents or a place the government leases to her. 20 years from now, where will the clothes and sneakers and earrings be? I have seen the young women walk to church with their babies. They have Gucci strollers, the best clothing, manicures, and whatever the non-black owned jewelry supply store had to sell. During the service, people passed the babies clad in earrings, their Air Jordan sneakers, whether they could walk or not, from pew to pew. I saw a Facebook message posted by a young black mother holding some fancy baby sandals, which read, fuck some Jordans. I want my baby to be classy. In many communities, the dirty, dirty South resembles a web of outward materialism for competition with and approval of other black women, which I believe is a result of economic, self-esteem, psychosocial, and self-hatred oriented remnants of slavery, Jim Crow, and the economic equality which followed. Some peaches make purchases just to impress the next peach or just so the next peach won't have anything negative to say about her. Since this book is for black women, about black women, and for our healing, let me just make it plain. Many of us will buy anything and everything for sale, yard decorations, clothes for our grandchildren, hair, nails, lashes, clothes for our men, furniture was, which has been marked up with crazy interest rates for the non-cash payers, abortions, deodorants full of aluminum because some treat us and look at us as if we stink, and what are, whatever else we think will make us feel as if we're doing better than the next black and just like the white folk. Take the case of Tekla, not a real name. She's a local civil rights organization officer, the mother of three grown children who live with her in a government-owned Section 8 apartment, a disability SSI recipient and food stamp recipient. Although she is an archetypal local civil rights leader, she always claims poverty and speaks of at least three generations in her family who were are supported by the government. Tekla says she never knew who her father was. She bragged about her mother who reared them in the projects and said her mother only carried a key and some lipstick in her pocketbook. This is just an example of the simple, uncomplicated life she led. Essentially, you have a slave rearing a slave. Children love their mommies, and like me and so many others, you cannot look at her lifestyle or advice objectively until you're in your middle years. Tekla said she never went to the prom because her mother told her if you go to the prom, you'll get pregnant. Tekla shared the way her sister kept preventing her foster child from graduating high school because she said she did not want his social security check to be terminated. In some cases, even if a child turns 18, if they are still in high school or have a disability themselves, the check will continue. One sister put her boyfriend in a nursing home 
Tecla found she Tecla said she found a thousand dollars in the boyfriend's apartment and kept it. She said she kept it because her sister never did anything for her. Tecla would brag, I put flowers on my table like the white folks do. This is mind blowing. From the plantation to waiting on white folk to this great America we live in today, we have to make, as Ollie calls it, boss moves. As blacks, we inherited property with the lack of reparations. As women, we inherited debasement and disrespect due to the patriarchal system of America and the world. As blacks who are women, beautiful black women, we have inherited sexism, classism, and more isms than we can list. Since this is a guide about thriving, we need to look at the portraits of Tekla's life, your life, and my life, and determine in what ways and by what means we can thrive. We will meet other peaches like Tekla in the portraiture section of this book. I have not heard of any landowner in South Carolina, Mississippi, Virginia, or North Carolina who benefited from slavery who is going to divide their 800 attached acres between eight other black people and me yet. With that, we need to realize that while there may be inequality gaps within the realm of material resources, we can be ethical, hardworking, innovative, optimistic, organized, and, more, and move this thing forward in spite of the historical context. Let's face it, we're only 150 some years removed from slavery. Everyone looks good when they're young. RuPaul looks gorgeous with makeup and a wig. I know we need affirmation. However, I think social media has taken the consumer factor to the next level. Even some professional friends would rather spend hours, four hours laying out their kids' holiday gifts to photograph and share on social media than spend the four hours listening to their kids' dreams and fears and hopes and desires. There's no judgment. I simply hope that we can do more self-examination here and use the grace, mercy, time, resources, and lessons from other peaches to move this thing forward. Although we have no common language or tribal affiliation, when we were born as descendants of African slaves, we have always had faith in some type of faith community. My sister Peaches, who followed Minister Louis Farrakhan in the Nation of Islam, probably have some soul searching to do, because not surprisingly, Minister Farrakhan announced this year that Jesus is alive. He has referred to Jesus as his Redeemer. Farrakhan said he had to answer for teaching the wrong things for 40 years. I was delighted to hear him deliver his confession of faith because as scripture teaches, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Philippians 2 and 10. Many of us have been reared in or exposed to either mainline or historically black denominations. The oldest black church, which is the African Meeting House in Boston, Massachusetts, and the oldest black denomination is the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the AME Church. So friends, this is where we'll end chapter three on black economic power. In our next video, we will look at the black church, the black church in America. Thank you for joining me for this reading of Peaches, Womanist Thoughts on Finding Peace, overcoming peril and tapping power. If you enjoyed this video, please give me a thumbs up and share. If you didn't like it, please give me a thumbs down. And in the meantime, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you and give you peace, power and love, more love, boost.